All right, let's, uh, we're going to pivot now and just talk about one or two more things, and then I've got a couple of concluding thoughts. But in, in this section, I'm going to pivot and uh, talk a little bit more like an um, insurance lawyer and talk about liability risks for you, okay? Um, my suggestion here is the suggestion that supports the city structure, and I'm going to talk about how organizational structure is connected to risk, right? And uh, now this risk admittedly doesn't present itself all that often in terms of lawsuits against individual elected or appointed officials, but it is absolutely a risk. Uh, and it's a very significant risk because it's the risk where you know someone can potentially hold you personally liable, right? So, um, and I don't mean to be the Grim Reaper, but I kind of want to go through some risk principles here and that kind of thing, okay? So, I, I hope it wasn't your first question for less when you got elected or appointed, right? <laughs> but it's a fair question to ask, you know, can I be sued and can I be held individually and personally liable for something that I do or don't do as a public official? And the answer is, Yes, it's technically it's possible. Sure, it's possible, right? But here's the good news. I want to start with the protection that you have. Uh, and what I'm talking about here again is whether someone can sue you and hold you personally individually liable for some act or omission as an appointed official or elected official. And I'm primarily talking about state law risk first, state law claims. Under, in Colorado, we got a nice statute, good, prote good protections for public officials. We want that. Right? We want people to be encouraged to step up and serve their community without undue fear or risk of liability. Right? So we have a statute called the Colorado Governmental Immunity Act. And what it basically says is this. The city, and by extension the city's insurance company, SORSA, will defend you and will pay judgments entered against you for acts or omissions as a public official. Good news. I'm protected. Right? <laughs> Well, like so many things in life, there's, there's a catch to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there are certain conditions to that, right? You are protected so long as you are acting within the scope of your employment and not acting in a willful and wanton manner, okay? There's two interesting phrases there. The scope of employment usually sounds odd from an elected or appointed official's standpoint because you're thinking, well, scope of employment doesn't apply to me because I'm not an employee like the city attorney or the clerk or the manager. Well, yes, it does. Scope of employment is simply the phrase that's used in this liability statute. And what it really means is one must understand, appreciate, and stay within the scope of their job duties, the scope of their authority, right? I'll give you a real simple example of that. Within, within the city of Trinidad structure, you require business licenses, right? Yes. Within the city structure, <coughs> job description within whose scope of employment is it to decide whether or not an applicant gets a business license? Yeah. It says. <laughs> yeah, the clerk's office. So in whose scope of employment ain't it? Everybody else. Everybody else. <laughs> not, just, not just you, but every other employee, every other department has it. It's the clerk's job. How did we get there? Well, the city council decided they didn't want that job. They gave it to right, the clerk. It runs the other direction as well. Within the city of Trinidad, within the scope of employment, is it to decide whether or not we adopt an ordinance that allows backyard chickens. Do you allow that? Yeah. Who's yeah. yeah. just in there? <laughs> Oh, just want to be malodorous. Yeah. Yeah. That's the city that's in their scope of employment, right? Within whose scope of employment, within whose job duties is it to make a hold a public hearing and make a recommendation on a proposed rezoning of property? Planning commission. Within whose scope of employment can everybody else? So this concept of allocation of responsibility, allocation of authority, or delegation of authority permeates every municipal organization. So for us individually, it simply means we need to understand what our role is within the organization, stay within that role, right? Be committed to that role, right? And understand that things outside of that role belong to others in the organization. It's a wise organization and it's an organization firing on all cylinders when people understand and appreciate 
right, those allocations of responsibility, okay? Um, second, you're protected as long as you're not engaging in willful and wanting conduct. That's just a fancy phrase for conduct that's intentionally undertaken, that's designed to injure someone's legal rights, and is taken with reckless disregard for what their rights are. I got an even simpler way of describing it. I just call it bad stuff. <laughs> bad stuff. Yeah. That's what it is. It's like conduct that's accompanied by a mere evil motive, right? Right? And I, I went to my claims people, and let's knock on wood. We don't get many claims in that area. Sometimes we do. We do certainly get claims where there's an allegation that some elected or appointed official or employee engaged in willful and wanton conduct. My claims people tell me that that risk presents itself almost always in this situation. It's almost always an individual elected or appointed official misperceiving <laughs> that they've got some governmental authority that they actually don't have, right? And they throw on that purported cloak of governmental authority and they go around and start doing bad things to people for the wrong reasons. And it really would be bad stuff. I just give you an example from some of our claims. It would be, you know, throwing on that cloak of governmental authority and you know, maybe conscripting a staff member so that they're not looking at the issue the right way now, and going on some campaign to make sure that, the, you know, their, their business competitor doesn't get a business license, right? Or that um, their political enemy has their building permit revoked, right? Or that they're intentionally defaming and libeling someone, you know, and they're purporting to act as an official of the city. Right? Or they're engaging in malicious conduct, or they're even, you know, misusing the cloak of governmental authority to engage in criminal activity. That's all bad stuff. <clears throat> the double whammy, of course, is that if that's what's going on, if you're found to have engaged in willful and wanton conduct, the city has no obligation to defend or pay that liability, nor does the insurance company, certainly. <clears throat> because intuitively, let's think about it, public officials insured, the good news is you got great you got good coverage, <laughs> right? But that coverage has exclusions where the civil liability flows from things like criminal conduct for which you've been convicted or willful and wanton conduct. So, okay? So we're going to stay away from that. We all intuitively know what that is, but I wanted to explain the outer boundaries of what the protections are, okay? Um, that sounded a little ominous, right? <laughs> and it is. It is. If, you, if you're found to engage in willful law and conduct and you have a big liability judgment entered against you and it includes punitive damages, the city has no obligation to pay those punitive damages. We at SIRSA, punitive damages are uninsurable in Colorado law, so we have no obligation to pay either. Now, to be fair, if you actually have punitive damages entered against you, the statute says, well, you can go ask the city council if the city would be willing to pay them on your behalf. That's not an awkward conversation. <laughs> to say the least, right? Uh, so we're going to stay away from that stuff. We know intuitively uh, where that lies, and we're going to be in a good spot. Um, to end on a, on a silver lining, you know, on the other hand, you, know, you, you need to understand where these boundaries are, what your protections are. But on the other hand, don't let the fear of liability drive decision making. Okay? And by the rewards and commissions, I'm probably never going to see this risk, but maybe the council will hold you if someone is threatening to sue you individually, you know, let's say we've got a, a, a rezoning application from the council and the applicant, all the evidence points to this, this should be denied, and we're going to deny it. And the applicant says, you know, council, if you do that, I'm going to sue each and every one of you individually. Right? That's what these protections are for. If we know that we're making the right decision through a fair, defensible process, applying the appropriate rules, we're going to be just fine. Okay? And don't stray the course just because of that threat. The threat, threat that risk rarely, if ever, presents itself to advisory boards, right? Um, the bigger risk, I think, for advisory boards is um, a member who thinks that they have more power than they actually have, not understanding their role, starts to get involved in some personnel or administrative issues that they have no authority over and gets themselves in the table uh, that way, okay? All right, uh, a couple tips on how to just avoid any concerns around this idea. Just understand the job description. Where do I find that? Well, for each board of commission, there's probably an ordinance or a resolution or some provision that outlines what your duties are. Look at that and embrace that. That's what we were, that's what council created our, they want us to study this issue, whatever it is, historic preservation, forestry, right? Uh, and that's where we're going to spend our effort, and that's the only place we're going to spend our effort. Uh, and recognizing that, yeah, maybe we don't get 
get to make the final decision. You know, maybe we don't have a role in this or that aspect of city operations or city business, but that's fine. Because we were selected and appointed to be champions within our own sphere of influence. Right? And that's where we want to maintain our focus. Okay? Um, there is absolutely safety in numbers. You're protected. You're all the more protected from an insurance attorney's perspective when it's clear you understand that our role is a group role. And we do our business primarily by meeting as a board or commission and acting on items, talking about items that are in front of us in the public meeting. Intuitively, you can just see that. It's very hard for someone to say, what if the, the board makes a controversial recommendation to counsel if something bad and says, well, I don't like that recommendation, and I, you know, I'm going to sue, I, I can sue just you. <laughs> you know, I might have, but it's like, I'm just one of the board members. How, how this intuitively can't happen. Uh, so, uh, that kind of thing, okay? Um, with regard to the advisory law, I do recognize, I poked through your code a little bit, for a lot of the advisory boards, your heavy lift, and absolutely the heavy lift, never underestimate the importance of the board. Right, but sometimes I hear this, well, you know, as the advisory board, we don't get to make the final decision, so let's just push this off to the account. Right? No, you want to embrace, you know, you're the body that gets to study issues, make recommendations, but also recognize from a risk standpoint that it is an advisory board. You don't want to be predicting outcomes at the city council level or guaranteeing to people that this, you know, Sometimes the, the really interesting people will be in all your advisory board meetings and they'll get the sense that this is a done deal, and, but we're not 100% sure what the council's going to do or where this is going to go, so we have to be cognizant of that aspect um, as well. Okay? Um, just to touch on it real quickly, each board of commission has a job description, right? Um, and I guarantee you this, it does not involve being an employee supervisor. The city council is a supervisor of a couple of employees, but that's city council as a group. And city council as a group supervises the city manager, the city attorney, the judge, anybody else. That's it. That is wonderful for all of you as elected and appointed officials. You know why that's wonderful? Because you don't have any authority, it's outside your scope of employment, to deal with any employment issues. What a great place to be. Because employment practice and liability risk is pervasive, it's complicated, right? And it didn't say on the application sheet to become a board of commission member or on the ballot, it didn't say HR manager, it said policymaker, right? Uh, having that role in the organization. So just recognize that, right? You don't want to get individually or improperly involved in personnel issues or in administrative matters assigned to staff, right? Um, now, recognize on the other hand that your staff liaison is assigned to you as your staff. They're your resource, they're your point of contact, right? But they're not your employee to give orders to. They're a person who's there to serve as a resource and support you. Um, but don't misperceive that as we are their supervisor. That's for they're actually you know, the nine to five supervisor who's their department head. Uh, or whoever. Okay? Be respectful of their time. Uh, you probably have systems around this, but recognize. You know, we, we, we should probably develop a, a process for how do we make requests to staff? And are we respectful of the fact that, you know, staff can't drop everything and respond to requests? And their accountability is to the board or commission that they staff as a whole, right? And so we want to resist the temptation to monopolize or use staff time to, you know, go after our own issues, right? We as a board I'll be collectively identifying where do we need some staff support or staff help on these issues. Okay? I don't know if Steve you want to add any no. comments about how those systems work. Okay. Yep. This uh, slide has a couple of scenarios here. All of them you can look at them on your own. These all have to do with risks around role discipline, right? And getting outside one's scope of employment. Okay? Um, so take a look at those. I won't, I won't get into them, but you can you'll recognize the risk when you read them. And you, know, you look at it and go, wait a second. Isn't the foundational question, what is my role? And if I'm tempted to do something, is this in my role? And if it's not, then we want to stay away, stay away from that. Okay? Now, I'm not naive. Before I joined the I was a city and town attorney. I left for 25 years. And I know sometimes, maybe not for board commission members, but council maybe, when well, maybe someone, a citizen, who got a nice relationship with a citizen, they come up to you and they've got a complaint about a city employee. 
<laughs> right? Or maybe it's internal. Maybe it's your employee comes to you and goes, can I talk to you about my boss? <laughs> What's our response to that? <laughs> we love and appreciate our employees, but I, as an elected employee official, and we, as a board of commission, we don't get involved in those issues. I encourage you to talk to your supervisor, the manager, or HR, or whoever you need. And, and that's, that's a wonderful place to be. Unburden yourself of that. And, and enjoy the fact that you can unburden yourself. And also be respectful when, if, if you do hear that, before you even can get out those words, the person starts to make a complaint against an employee. You're going to go to Steve, right? And you're going to unburden yourself from that. And be respectful when he says, what do you mean? I got it. I got it. I got it. Because he does. That's what the code says. That's what the charter says. It says that he and his supervisors are responsible for the supervision of the city employees. Okay? Uh, that's probably the most common risk I see in actual real world litigation again. The elected or appointed official getting snarred in some personnel issue that they had no authority over. And uh, then we've even had ones where it led us to have to interview or take depositions of elected or appointed officials when they got snarred in some um, personnel issue down within the organization somewhere. I have never had an elected or appointed official come back to me after we took the deposition and said, that was a lot of fun. Was <laughs> <laughs> right? So I get it. This is probably this is probably not for the council members, but sometimes you know there, maybe there is still a question or a concern about some issue involving the staff. Your point of contact and resources, and he recognizes that, right? That's part of your supervisor relationship. So once in a while, he may have to tell you something on a need-to-know basis. But it's not to invite people in to you know, start making group decisions around those kinds of things. The city council itself does have an appropriate role on certain employment issues, but that's probably the broad policy stuff. Overall personal policies, overall organizational structure, overall budget. You want to keep your energy focused on those issues. Okay. Let's see. Um, last piece on this. We, we talked about ethics. We talked about organizational structure. I do believe, and I do recommend as a best practice, that being on a multi-member board or commission, right, does sometimes ask us to make personal sacrifices in terms of putting the interest and the strength of the board or commission as a whole ahead of our own interests. So let's think about it. Hey, 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 this board is kind of like a train. You know, you know? We want that train to go to, to get to its destination. And we all, during our term of office, we get on that train and we help move it forward. But we want to make that engine stronger, right, as it goes forward. And so I think there are some personal sacrifices around that that I've listed here. Things like setting aside a personal agenda when there's lack of support. That can be, yeah, I, I, that can be frustrating. You know, I, I saw an elected office or I saw an appointment because I want to make sure this city adopts a backyard chicken ordinance. Right? But if I can't find, you know, a majority of members to come along with me to make that recommendation or pass that ordinance, I have to be willing to shelve my own personal agenda, right, in service of the work plan of my board of commissioners identify my identity. And be careful in your interactions with whoever you take the council from, too. And if they were thinking, that's why you got to elect you, you got to make sure those expectations are reasonable. You can't be promising people that you can get things done on an individual. Uh, basis. What do you, do you all have split votes? Oh, <coughs> the mayor in the hot seat. Do you have split votes every once in a while? Yes. So if you're on the you know the, the short side of a four three vote or the losing side of a four three vote, is it okay to go back to your people you know, and go tell them I didn't vote for that one? <coughs> I'm just insurance guy. <laughs> you can you can tell your people whatever you want. Absolutely. That you could tell the people be a little close, whatever you want about that decision. But would the message be, they already know how you vote, right? Because it's on the record. Would the message be stronger in terms of strengthening your board commission council institution? If, if, if you at least coupled with that, yeah, I didn't vote for that one, but you know what? We had a real vigorous discussion at the council. There were a lot of different opinions. There were a lot of you know, strongly different opinions. I fought like hell from my point of view, but you know what? Council decided to go a different direction, and I respect the decision that was made by council. Right? And that's the true also with recommendations of boards. Right? We all have, we're going to always on our own side. We don't have to be the number one cheerleader. A 
a decision with which we disagree. But from a liability standpoint, we certainly, right, cannot do things that attempt to undermine that decision. And it can have risk consequences. I'll give you a real life example. I had a real controversial development. It was approved on a 4 3 vote at the governing body level. The governing body finally got to the four when they said, all right, we'll, we, we can approve this with what? With, with a condition. The condition is we approve, but you have to go to the neighbor and get an easement for another access to help alleviate the traffic. Okay. So a member is on the three side of the 4 3 vote. After the meeting next day, he goes and talks to the adjoining property owner. Good idea? Not such a great idea. <laughs> right? Yeah. And he was trying to convince the neighbor not to grant the easement. Right? Uh, there was a real liability risk in that because it's, you can't take that hat off that easily. That was a member of the body that night before said that we give you an authority to go ahead, something in this condition. And here I am, a member of the same body, attacking that condition. Well, what's the legal potential legal risk? Tortious interference with the actual legal more nuance for advising boards and commissions. It might present itself this way. We had a tough discussion, tough recommendation to cancel on the chicken ordinance. And I voted against the chicken ordinance. I hate chickens. <laughs> I'm going to go to city council, and I'm going to continue to convince city council that they shouldn't have a chicken ordinance. Good idea? Bad idea. On one hand, the person saying, I have every right to the to do that. But, but also, you had a you had higher level, right, of participation in the issue because you were only one of seven people who helped make that recommendation, which has a higher standing, presumably, right? So, yeah, it may not present itself in terms of legal rights, but you have to think about what's the impact on my board or commission. You also have to put the shoe on the other foot and think about, okay, well, I was on the losing end of this one. I'm still going to champion a cause that my board can agree with. How would I feel? Right, if another member of my same board, right, were doing the same thing, right, and not really, you know, respecting the voice of the board. So, I don't know how that ultimately works out, you know. Maybe it's the person could still appear in the related council, but they ought to say, you know, hey, I'm a member of this advisory board, you know, and I respect the decision that our advisory board made, and I'm just here to advocate as a private citizen, right, uh, with my own personal view. But, you know, what, as I said at the beginning, what's the public proceeding? <laughs> public official. Public official. Okay. Uh, another one, remember our work is done. When you, once you make a recommendation, there might be the handoff of council, so then they get to take it over if you're a council and you're done like with the rezoning decision. After that, actually probably pursuing the actual building on the property, and that gets handed off to staff. And so we respect when our work is done and when our work begins, and then outside of that, um, we, we don't think, do things that get outside of our scope of employment. And, and then the last one is a little more nuanced. It doesn't present itself in terms of liability risk all that much, but I do get calls all the time from my airport officials around this last bullet because they ask me, is there a statute that will magically solve this problem? <laughs> and I say there's not. Um, and that is, particularly in this age where everybody, do you, do you feel like citizens want to know everything today if not yesterday? Yeah. You know, sometimes there's this sense that bubbles up internally among the board or commission or governing body that, you know, we have members who are getting ahead of it, who are speaking, you know, for the board before we've had a chance to speak. I think it's a wise body that recognizes that and that as individuals are respectful of that because it can put our fellow members in a tough spot, right? If there's one of us out there who's you know, trying to predict the outcome or purporting to speak for the board before we've even spoken. So be respectful of fellow members and of your board and commission in that regard. Okay. All right, this last suggestion I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to put it, highlight it, and then set it aside because it's a separate training and it'll take too much time. And I'm happy to come back and, and visit with the audience to do this. But I just, for, for City Council, Planning and Zoning Commission, Historical Preservation Commission. Just want to recognize that we've been talking about the main job as policy maker, right? But for those three groups, sometimes you make decisions that affect people's individual property rights, and it usually involves a licensing application or a land use application. Um, well, that's a pretty 
pretty awesome path. Depends on the planning commission, seven people. The city council, seven people get inside whether or not property gets subdivided or rezoned or somebody gets a license to do something. And we want that power. We want local control. I love local control. But if, if we want local control, we have to recognize that when people ask us for approval with regard, or you know, maybe not, regarding use of their own property, then we're really acting as judges, and they have protective rights under the due process clause, right? No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So the way that transfers into what you do is, as the decision makers on those land use applications, primarily need to understand that there are different rules about how we have to conduct ourselves individually and as a group with regard to land use applications and licensing applications. And they're kind of counterintuitive because they're, they're a little bit at odds with what you might think the job usually is. Like when we're making policy, decide whether or not we're going to pursue this project or pass the chicken ordinance, that's kind of legislative activity. And in that regard, we can lobby and be lobbied. We can vote yes or no because we love or hate chicken. We can whip up support. We can whip up opposition. We can do our own research. But when we're standing in judgment of people's applications, all of that goes out the window. And we have to individually conduct ourselves the same way a judge would. And we have to do the things that judges would do and avoid doing what judges wouldn't do. Okay? So that's just to introduce the topic. Some of the things like that, for example, we know when we're in that mode, that judge-like quasi-judicial mode, because the, the agenda says public hearing. <laughs> okay? Um, but some of the tips around that is, for those public hearing items, you know, <clears throat> we can't get involved before the hearing. We can't be talking to the applicant or the proponents of the opponents outside of the hearing. We can't be doing our own research. We can't be talking to the newspaper reporter, sorry, um, <laughs> before the hearing. You know, the newspaper reporter says, oh, I see you got another conditional use permit for a drive through restaurant. What do you think about that, planning commissioner? And, you know, before the hearing, you say, well, you know what? We got enough, and I will never vote in favor of another drive through in the city again. Does that sound like a fair and impartial vote? Yeah. So you can see this is counterintuitive, and it also requires that we only make our decision based on the standards that apply. We can't vote yes or no just because we don't like it. <laughs> right? And staff's there to support you. That's why the staff report articulates all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I just want to introduce that topic. For those of you who do have that role of making quasi-judicial decisions, there's a link on the last slide for two presentations that I've done that give you more information about these rules of engagement. Good for everybody, though, know, because if you're on a board of commission member and you're friends with a council member, you need to recognize, too, that, you know, if, if, if you read, who's the one who said social media? <laughs> if you read on social media, there's a controversial development coming up, you may think, oh, well, I know a council member and I know a planning commission. I'm going to call them and start telling them why they should vote yes or no. You can't do that either. It's like citizens can't and should, right? Um, so it's good for everyone to understand what these rules of engagement are, and there's two presentations there. Last, getting away from quasi-judicial, I do want to, this, this touches on all types of decision-making, but particularly for quasi-judicial. When it becomes decision time or recommendation time, we as CERTs have always appreciate when the members who are going to make the decision or recommendation have a good deliberation amongst themselves before deciding the issue. A lot of magical things happen there. That's where the audience now begins to understand, right, your basis of reasoning for the independent decision. If it's a quasi-judicial matter, that's where we're actually making the legal record that we'll use to defend you. But most importantly, as respect citizens and transparency, it's where you're showing them what the process is and what the thinking is behind governmental decision making. And when we do that, it's always right, going to build faith and trust. You know, having staff there to support you, you know, if it's a rules-driven decision, you can always ask staff, hey, what's the standards that apply here? Right? Can you help me understand what those are? That's going to, that's going to help. You. And Sam, just one point on that. Um, sometimes the council and actually some of our boards and commissions as well get accused of just rubber stamping items when taking official action. But uh, in the case of the council, um, more often than not, the issue has been thoroughly discussed at a work session. So by the time they're taking action on it, it's not a rubber stamp. They've actually vetted it, they've debated it in a public meeting, 
and sometimes people miss that. And I know some of you all will, will work sessions on, on items as well, and then um, vote on them in regular meetings. So I think it's really important that uh, people look at the process holistically as well, and don't just assume that we're ignoring it or not having that public debate. Yeah, yeah. In, in terms of just behaviors in the moment to help with that, you know, we know it is. Sometimes it's the only the final meeting that people make it out to. Yeah. And sometimes I'll criticize. Them. I've not heard this before. You know, just reminding them be a champion of your process and respect and recognize that they may have concerns. I appreciate your comment. Understand um, your question about process. Just want to remind people, maybe staff or the providing officers, saying it's been a long road. <laughs> Just want to, you know, we've got information available, we've had a number of work sessions around this issue. People are always welcome to come and come, but as you know, people often show up just at the, the penultimate meeting or the final meeting. Sure. Yeah. I agree with the gist of what Mr. Bruder said. I think that you earlier had mentioned that there might be, it might be important for council to uh, consider whether it's actually deliberating in a work session, rather than just discussing, because it sounded like you were saying deliberation needs to happen from a legal perspective, um, there's no state statute that draws a line between one or the other. There are some, some of our members in the home rule charter um, will have language around those issues. I'll give you an example. I think this is what's ready for a city, and we have to have enough charter. Uh, provision said work sessions are solely for information and background. No direction of staff is allowed, no, no deliberation, no discussion of merits and substance. So, and we had a lot of um, refereeing in work sessions to make sure that, that we stayed on point. So, yeah, sometimes rules like that can, you know, written with the best intentions can be kind of cumbersome to work through in the moment, too. But, but yeah, if that's your general sense, then be faithful to the general sense of what you're supposed to learn in all those sessions. I think it might be helpful if we at least say when we're deliberating on this issue, let's consider whether it's in our discussion part what was persuasive to us about that discussion so that people understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think just before the vote, people love that summation and they love to hear the presiding officer you know, give everyone, every member a chance to speak, whether they take it or not. Right? Make some final comments before the action. I think that's both in terms of faith and trust and risk. All right. Uh, just to wrap things up, my last suggestion, it doesn't sound like I'm a risk management suggestion, but it is, right? Let's use our governmental power wisely and humanely. Going back to my opening slide, just remember the fact that we, as the elected employee officials, try to help set the tone for the entire organization. Make sure that we use, even if it's in the face of incivility, that we use courtesy, tact, and diplomacy, especially in public settings as a board. You know, each other and the staff commit to a no surprises approach. Meetings ought not to have gotcha moments, right? They certainly ought not to have staff bashing. You know, and sometimes the public comment during public comment is a special attack on the staff, right? Imagine how powerful it is, even if we have a concern about the staff issue, we just made that comment. You know, our meetings are not an appropriate place for staff bashing or personal attacks. Right? How powerful and supportive. Um, it is to do to do that, right? Um, so, commit to efficient, effective, respectful meetings. Embrace civility, no matter how difficult the circumstances. This last bullet I put up here was um, also I do think particularly for elected employee leadership, part of the job is touting our success. Who agrees with the notion that uh, it seems like within the press sometimes and social media in particular. A lot of the focus is on the negative. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, was, I was a newspaper reporter in prior life, so I, 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 you know, we're looking for just the, yeah. but, but newspapers do report on the papers. But you know, in terms of yeah, but a lot of times it's up to us. And I think part of the job responsibility to the reporting business is having the success of our board or commission or council, having the success of our staff and our organization. Why is the insurance guy saying this? Because I think in the broader context of the community conversation around what local government does, it's important that it was accentuate the positive, that was some of the song, right? And that does, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, yeah, maybe this might be influencing a potential jury pool somewhere down the road. Right? Where do I see this most? Police liability, right? 
there's a big connection, if you want one, between societal attitudes about government and the increasing trend of the value of settlements and rewards. But I think it's, it, it's, it's not always about that. It's about you know, showing the community that we're doing great things on behalf of the community to move our community forward. So always do that. Uh, and always you know, commit to the service of the city as an organization, to your board, commission, and council, as an institution and embrace those stewardship and fiduciary aspects of your work. So, with that, uh, for the quasi-judicial folks, if you'd like one, I do have another handout, a little one-page handout that goes dives a little bit deeper into what that goal is and what some tips are around that. Um, and there's on the last slide a couple more resources from the source. So with that, I'm going to open it up to any final questions that you have. Thank you all very much for inviting me down to visit with you all this morning. I appreciate it. So, um, thank you all. We uh, just have a couple more things to wrap up, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Want to go next slide? Sure. All, all right. right. Russ has some comments he'd like to make. And, um, if anybody needs to stand up, these chairs are not the most yeah, of so feel free to put some coffee and enjoy yourself. Good morning, everybody. So, I want to begin by saying that I know that for many of you, one like perceived as kind of a pariah in the like anti-board commission member. And I, I I really hate that because I want to emphasize that we are all here, when I say we I mean staff, we are all here for all of you. And I, I know that at times we may seem like we're at odds and we're you know not all rowing the, the same boat. That's not the case. And I want to tell you that I, you know, I should speak for myself, but I'm always here for any of you. If any of you have any questions, if any of you have anything you want to talk to me about, I would, I would invite you to do that. You know, when Steve said at the beginning of this meeting that we have a very good, thank you, Sam, that we have a good track record for avoiding liability, that we are a low liability uh, jurisdiction, it's because we don't get sued very often. And we don't get sued very often because everybody is doing business, for the most part, appropriately, correctly, openly, honestly, and doing what they need to do. And I, I want to say um, one thing as I begin, and that is, I really want to emphasize, even though this is kind of obvious to everyone, especially after the presentation this morning, there is one set of rules for all of us. So when you call in and you ask Des, say, for your board commission, if you can post an agenda 12 hours before a meeting, and she says, no, you can't do that, it's not because she's being difficult with you or just saying that your board or commission has to have a higher standard. She's doing that because those are the rules. And we're, we're never trying to you know, be, be difficult with any of you or have any of you treated any differently. These are all rules that are based on legal considerations, state law, ordinance, charter, what have you. And we are simply there to, to give you the rules as, as they exist. I want to say something, and this is kind of awkward for me to say. And by the way, I love Pat Howard like a brother. <laughs> Okay, a brother that I fight with a lot, but a brother <laughs> that we We really do want to talk. Exactly. But, you know, I'll talk to you. You know, I'll talk about the, the points the Pat raises in a moment. But um, you guys, like, if you have a question and you come to me and you ask me for a legal opinion, and I give you that legal opinion, I hate to tell you this, but my legal opinion is what you have to go by, okay? And I, I say that not to like pat myself on the back or say that I'm always right, but my legal opinion, it, it's always going to be on the law as I understand it. But if you deviate from my legal opinion on a certain subject, then you're kind of on your own. And all the things that Sam was talking about, liability, 
about you guys, you know, you need to stay the, the course in your moral words of Bush the Elder. You, you need to do what is lawful. You need to do what I'm telling you. And if you, um, if you deviate from that and you go outside that, well, let's say you get in trouble and the city gets sued, one of the first questions that you may be asked is, well, did you get a legal opinion on that subject? And if you say, yes, I did, and I went against it, then that is really not going to be good for you. So I just want to say, and you can always disagree with me, Pat Hallett, that's the name of Pat Hallett, so you can always disagree with me, and if you do, um, I will ask for another opinion, or I will tell you, no, I, I think, you know, the law in this regard is well settled, and it's, it's really not, um, you know, reasonably questioned. Um, but, but if you have a, a legal question, ask it, I will tell you, but please just don't deviate from that. And also, all the rules that we talk about, everything that we're doing, it is all in an effort to keep everything open, transparent, fair decision-making process, and, and giving everybody a, a stake in the outcome and feeling like they were treated fairly. I, I want to say before I forget, and that is, if you're making a decision, if your board commission is going to be making a decision, and someone is before you, let's say you have an applicant, and it is a quasi-judicial matter, it is absolutely correct that you need to give the reason why you are voting the way you are, especially if it's a private property uh, interest, and you're, you're planning and zoning or your city council, you need to give a reason. And I will tell you, as an example, years ago before I was city attorney, I was representing a guy who was losing his liquor license. There was an allegation that his bar was, uh, that, that there was drug activity in the bar, I represented him. We went before city council, we had the hearing, they had an executive session, and they came out. This was, you know, city council many years ago, and they came out, and they all voted without comment to revoke my client's liquor license. So that is going to give a person, you know, a person who has business before your board or commission, it's going to give them a bad taste in their mouth every single time. And just give a reason why. It should be a lawful reason, but you need to give a reason why. And even, you know, like city council, if it was a matter of kind of a, you know, something they discuss it in a work session, that point is usually made. Like we discussed this previously in a work session, now we're at a regular meeting, and now council is going to be voting on that. But nonetheless, especially if you have private parties who have an interest at stake, it is very important for you to give a reason why you're voting the way you're voting, especially if you're denying an applicant um, something that they're coming before you asking for. And, um, you know, another example we used to have on city council, a council member who would always vote no on all marijuana licenses. He would always vote no. He would say, uh, you, know, you know I'm going to vote no, I'm going to vote no, and my vote is no. Well, the law is, if you, if you have an, an application for some lawful activity, and city council doesn't have a valid reason for saying no, then the obligation is to say yes. And you can do conditions like planning and zoning on a conditional use permit, you can do whatever, but you really have an obligation to say yes. You cannot arbitrarily and capriciously simply vote no on it. And yeah, that may not lead to legal liability if it's just one person voting, but if you have a majority of a body voting no and not giving a reason why, then there is going to be legal liability. So I, I want to touch on a few things. One, I, I want to talk about the ethics complaints and the removal of board and commission members. Um, I want to say we love good board and commissions and good board and commission members. There is nothing that has greater value to, you know, any city, but especially this city, than people who know how to run a good meeting, 
I always think of the Griegos because they know how to run a good meeting. Phil Rico, former mayor, was very good at, at running meetings. But there is nothing you know, more valuable than people who know how to run a good meeting and also people who know how to meaningfully and respectfully participate in a meeting. In a meeting. Man, is that ever good. And, you know, like you say, well, what does that look like and what does that mean? Well, it's kind of like the old Supreme Court definition of pornography. I know it when I see it. Right? It's kind of hard to define, but you know it when you see it. And so um, I say that because we don't want you know to have to be involved in your business. We don't want to have to you know have complaints or, or anything. And you know another way of saying that is we have your backs. And if you guys are doing city business and you're not abusing you know, your role or, or doing whatever, we have your backs. And I pride myself on being as loyal as a freaking Labrador retriever to those who do their jobs and are respectful to each other and to staff and to me and, and who are doing their jobs. And I will defend you you know, factually, actually, legally, I will defend you everywhere. Um, you know, in private and public. But when when somebody runs a foul, and let me say this: the ethics code applies to all board and commission members in city council. Okay, so where it talks about things you should do, you know, avoiding conflicts of interest, uh, avoiding you know nepotism and and uh, you know, and, and gifts and all the things that you, you need to avoid, all of that applies to every single board commission and council member. All of that does. But what doesn't apply to board and commission members is the provision for having a hearing for a complaint before city council. Now that is a that is a, a, an amount and level of due process that is only afforded when a council member gets a complaint against them. And the reason why that is the case is because a council member cannot be removed. If a, now, if a council member does something wrong, then a council member can have an ethics complaint against them, they can be admonished, they can have a level of but they cannot be removed because they were put on by way of a popular vote. The considerations for a board of commission member are you guys serve at the will of the pleasure of counsel and for just cause can be removed. Now that is my question is in charge. I'm sorry, I really I know that you know talking about a negative and I don't want to you know, overdo this, but counsel is able, what, what happens is if someone <coughs> is in the law or the ethics code, I write that board commission member a letter, they're able to respond and talk about the staff, I inform counsel confidentially of what is going on, and then the matter is on the consent agenda. So I just want to tell you that while it seems like that may be kind of a uh, giving me short shrift, the people who are being run against them are absolutely able to respond. They're absolutely able to tell me their versions of why they may feel <laughs> The timing is perfect. I, yeah. I, 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 I did, I did. I did. <laughs> so we have construction, we have a couple of Yes, so we have a couple of questions. Um, but anyway, I lost my train of thought, so go ahead. I want to take this from a different perspective yeah, sure. from how we are now assigning members to the boards. So instead of how we're taking them off, let's talk about how we're getting sure. them now. Sure. We as boards have set up bylaws and requirements. How does that apply to me as the new applicants? You have a great voice for talking yeah. about this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there are announced vacancies now. I know they were saying that they were going to talk about that. Okay. So they went through the process and, and all that, all that good stuff. Okay, we'll, we'll
ones who, of course, just got to put a period on the top years of my exhaustion. Yeah. The problem I had was never with the decision. The problem I had is when the council came out and the executive said they did not give the explanation you just gave, which I think would have resolved that if you're here, you don't get this portion of the discovery process. Well, that's done this way. It came out on the executive session. They talked it out and the decision was made. I'll echo what the councilwoman Oakley said. There are times where there's no explanation for the mechanism. And I know there's a desire to do that, but there are times, and again, it's on video, that there are no explanations. And, and, and I will tell you one of the things, when you've been coming to council for years, I remember you know, several years ago, you came before council one time and you were frustrated because, and this is a totally unrelated matter, but council didn't comment on what they had just talked about in executive session. And of course, executive sessions have to be confidential. And, and no one can talk about that. I understand your point, because it does look like they're coming out of the executive session and making a decision. I hate it when we have an executive session right before a decision, you know, before the next decision, because it makes it look exactly like that. But an explanation is allowed. Well, no, that's right. Not the deliberation right. right. process. Right, right, right. But that is the law. But, but please understand, it's not in the law for a, a removal of a commission member. And I will right. say, right, one of the things we, we do, and in that one that you and I have spoken about before, the, the one individual who, who I think I happened recently, don't want to mention names, uh, that we were not wanting to air out what the complaints were because it was a little embarrassing for that individual, right? I mean, we didn't want to publicly air it out what it was and what it was in the I just want to say, I want to say, I want to say, I want to say, I want to that they're not, that, that, that that's how it is, that, that telling people about the ethics violations, there needs to come, if you violate that, here's the thing that you have to do, because both the folks who got, were, were removed were new to some of some of the boards. Well, they hadn't been there. They didn't know. They were learning on the job. I think it was important for us to know the very first time. No, no absolutely. I moved that closer so I can Oh, okay. Okay, good. No, that, that totally makes sense. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that was what by me before we go by the mayor, whoever that mayor is, before we go to an executive session. There's only three specific things we can do. On both situations, we had one last night for legal advice. It was just legal advice from him to us. That is confidential. But I guarantee you, there are no decisions made in executive session. We don't make decisions. We want to know where we stand on the legalities of the situation. No, I do understand. I was mayor of the town. When we would come up with a session, we wouldn't say what the deliberation was. But our attorney we did have a say. What was the basis of that? And it would have been easy for less to have said, folks that are elected have this set of rules, folks that are appointed have this set of rules. That would have been something that you could have said. Yeah, we do. We, we, don't, we do yeah, say it in general. We come so. out of it and say we had to be in executive session for legal consul consultation. Like board commissioners and board Anything. members to know what, what their what, what the recourse is. That's all that's all. Okay. okay. So, you guys, I just want to say a couple of last things. And really, um, I, I just want to say, I want to emphasize, if any of you ever have any questions and you want to talk to me, please feel free. It's one of the things a city pays me for, okay? And I, my role is a little weird because I represent like collectives, like city council and boards and everyone. And I also represent individuals. And I always, you know, hope that they're not going to have, you know, issues against each other. But I mean, that includes all of you. It includes city employees. It includes board and commission members. And if you want to confide in me, you do, and you want to, you know, have a confidential communication, I am your lawyer. And you can call me. You can come talk to me. Just, I, I want to, you know, make that available to you. And 
one last thing, just a moment, please, man. And that is this. If ever you have something that you need to <coughs> tell your board confidentially, okay? And I'm always telling city staff this and city council, I'm getting something that's frequently forgotten. If you have a communication that you want to convey to your board and you want to do so confidentially, and that may seem rare, it probably is, come to me and I can, I can communicate with your board for you and do so confidential, okay? <laughs> and the importance for that is, is that if there ever is a Rule 106 proceeding, if there is any other kind of legal proceeding, we are, or there, excuse me, there's a quorum request. That is exempted from a quorum request, okay? So if you have a confidential matter, if you have something that is, you know, a difficult subject of conversation, I offer that to you. Of course, you would want to involve the chairperson and not the chair, but I just want to suggest that to you as a, as a tool to that. Yeah. Questions? Could I just say one thing about that, about social media? And I am always telling council this, and I am always telling staff this. If it's a, a city, you know, concern, if it's city business, I recommend you not weigh in at all. That you just not comment. I, so many people have learned that the hard way. And you don't, I'm not saying that's a requirement. I'm just saying whatever we say, if it's a controversial matter, they are going to just pick that apart. There's not going to be any really generally good that comes from it. And they're going to ignore generally what we're trying to say and glom on to what they want to hear. That's a reactive sort of policy to take. Yeah. But proactively, right. what are we allowed to share on the social media pages that matter about social business, about city, about on policies that we're working on? For Main Street, like how do we get that out on social media properly? We have a city staffer, so that's covered for us. But what are our parameters so that we don't we don't go outside of those and then get in trouble for it? Basically, like what do we have a policy that can be handed out and say this is what we are okay with? These are what we can work within the confines of. I feel a little bit lost in some right. of that. Right, and you're absolutely right. If it's proactive, you guys are you know you're you're allowed to do that. Right? This is we have margin, yeah, we have exactly. margin, so we're safe. But exactly. what about other boards that want to do right. social media campaigns? How do yes. you handle If you're doing things like an announcement or you're wanting to do a Facebook blast and it's something you're going to communicate on your own, then that is welcome. And that, that is welcome, that is appropriate, and that's great. I'm just talking about, you know, you get on Facebook, you see someone commenting on, you know, some matter, and you want to weigh in on that. That, that's what I'm saying you should avoid. And I'm not, you know, it's not like you're going to be terminating if you are doing that anyway, but it, you have to be careful sure. because, you know, with all the things that Sam was talking about, you do speak with one voice. And if it's something pending before the city, then it might be before a board of commission. And individually, we try to, you know, avoid that and, and just speak as a group. But the, the boards and commissions to, to announce things and, and say what you want, that's, certainly invite that. Can we have an onboarding package? Yeah, we will do board packets. Onboarding. How do you know a member? member? For this member. Okay. Is it a package? Okay. okay, good. So why don't you go? Are you ready? Yeah. Any other questions? Because Des will, will comment on that. Right? Okay. Anything else? Oh, right here. Hey, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And we're all rolling for the same thing. Well, <laughs> supposedly. Yeah. Hi. 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 <laughs> so, going on your topic, um, when there is a new member, the new member gets a certificate of appointment as well as a packet for that board, which explains the rules, it explains when the meetings are held, that type of thing. So they are sent. Whether you found one or not, I don't know. I just started doing this. I just, like in the last month, I just started. Do the boards need to provide you with that information so that we're aware? So, yes. yes. So I'm asking that each board provide me five to seven questions that 
you would like council to know about the board or to ask members who or somebody who wants to apply. So back in March, a resolution was passed where city council is now the vetters. Um, so someone who wants to join a board, they will fill out a citizen interest form. They have to be a resident of Los Angeles County for a year and they have to be a voter. Those citizen interest forms will come to me or they'll come to Audra. Um, we will make sure that they uh, meet those qualifications. We will have a work session where those um, members or you know, ones who want to be a member will come in front of council. Council will do interviews. If you have those five to seven questions, especially with bylaws, um, I can hand them off to city council and they could use those. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, right now we have three vacancies for arts and culture, three for Board of Building Code Appeals, two alternates on Board of Building Code Appeals, two for Library Advisory Board, two on Urban Renewal, one on historic preservation and one on urban forestry. So if you know of anyone who is interested, I would you know, definitely let them know. All they have to do is fill out that form. They can do it on our website. They can come into City Hall. They can do it by paper. Um, the chamber's taken to sending those out wherever you send them. So we're actually, yes, as a body, actively recruiting for all the words. And it's on the radio, too. Um, it's on our Facebook page, it's on our city website, um, so we're trying to get people to do that. Any other questions about that? No? Okay. So, last thing I want to talk about is agendas. We are in Agendas. They have to be 24 hours in advance. One is at City Hall and one is at the library. If you're in a crunch and you don't think you're going to make it within that 24 hour period, feel free to email me your agenda. Email it to Audra. We'll post it for you. The library is really good at us sending them in. They'll post it there, so just make sure you're doing that. Um, agenda should all have the city emblem. Unless you're Main Street or Lodging Tax, who have your own logo, but they should all have the city emblem. If you need one of these, I will send it to you. Um, they should all be in Georgia font. That's our approved font. What size? Georgia 11.5. 11.5. Um, they should all have the date. The date, the time. Sorry, sorry. They should all have the date, the time, the location, and if you're doing it virtually, it has to say the go to meeting information, the Zoom meeting, the team's information. It has to be listed on that agenda. Um, and they all should have the ADA notice on the bottom, which I think they do. Not highlight. Not highlight. I also manage the city's website, so if you want your agenda on the website, please send it to me at least 24 hours in advance would be nice. If I send it to Audrey, you'll get it. If you send it to Audrey, she'll send it to me. You see, the website is not a designated post. No, no ma'am. So these two visually sort of difficult, obscure places are the only places where our are actually come City Hall and the library. And it's been like that for 30 years. I would love to see websites We would much prefer that we have every agenda on the website, but we have to attend our board of commissions to send those to Des. So please make sure those are getting to her so we can get those posted as well. Hey, Des, what about preferred format? Like PDF, Word? Word, please, Word. I have to make every agenda ADA accessible. So if it's in a Word document, it makes it so much easier. For me. Georgia Fox. Georgia Fox. 11.5. 11 11.5. Word. 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 Yeah. Word. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Yes. So a city staff person can give format to you. That's what I did for the tree board. Um, I gave them a document. It's already set up. They just go in. <coughs> and this is just a little bit. Yes. 
she's been going in and posting it. You set me straight on the format last month, I think. I sent it to you for tonight's meeting and the PDF. Then you still posted it, right? I'm sure I did. <laughs> I think yours got moved for some reason. Wasn't it changed the date? Somebody's changed. Yours Mine. changed. Ours changed the date to tonight. Someone's changed. Tonight. Anyway, I'll just go by the library. Uh, if you send it to Audra, it's posted. Okay, all right. Yeah. I think so. Everybody across the yeah. street. Yeah. Oh, Audra, yeah. <laughs> Audra or I are happy to post it for Thank you. you. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I asked our Five minutes, so I will wrap up in five minutes. Um, thank you to all of our presenters, and thank you all again for being here. I know we probably have some folks watching online. Thank you guys for for uh, paying attention as well. Uh, I just wanted to go over one quick topic that uh, David actually brought up, and I'm glad he did. The role of the chair in um, in all of our boards and commissions and the council. So the chair really has no more power than any other board member in terms of voting or authority to make policy decisions. The chair's role is to be the, the head of the meeting body. And what that means is it's the chair's job to enforce the rules, Robert's rules. If there is a debate about something that's happening or a question, a concern about procedure, you would call what's called a point of order. And then the chair makes a ruling on that point of order and decides this is how we're gonna move forward based on that concern. Uh, the chair also is uh, the person who all interactions should go through the chair. Um, it really shouldn't just be a free-for-all. Sometimes that's effective, especially in a work session setting, and I don't mind that. But in general, if you want to speak, you should be asking the chair uh, for the floor and be acknowledged by the chair before speaking. And that's true of members of the public who come visit as well. Um, Decorum is, is incredibly important to me, and it should be to you as well. It's how we run efficient meetings, and it's how we ensure that everybody gets equal right um, to speak their mind. It's very inappropriate to be interrupting another board member or commission member when they have the floor, um, unless you do feel like they're out of order, in which case you would call the point of order, and the chair would respond there too. So that's kind of the, the basics of what the chair should be doing but it is really important that the chair is the person who's running the meeting, calling the meeting to order, asking for motions and seconds, and calling for the vote. Um, so that, that's the chair's role. I just wanted to mention a couple other things. Um, you know, a lot of things have come up about social media. I think we all know, um, to Amanda's point, social media runs this town. Um, there is a lot of negativity on, on social media, and there's also a lot of uh, telephone that I see where one person will make a comment and then it explodes into a much bigger issue than it actually is. Um, I would encourage you to check with our staff, your liaisons, um, and, and get our perspective on it as well. Us as uh, city officials, we can't always be out there monitoring and, um, and, and communicating our side of things. We are trying to get better communication, and I will admit that's something we are not the greatest at, and I, I definitely recognize that, and I'm sympathetic to that. Um, but on the flip side, what we'd like to see is a little bit more grace from our community um, in how we operate. I can personally tell you there's 162 employees that work for the city. When they see people say that nobody in the city is educated or qualified to do their job, they take that home with them. They're all members of this community who live here, and um, they, they love this community. And we work very hard to maintain high ethical standards, high accountability, and it's very important, I think, that we be sensitive to the fact that, you know, when they're getting bombarded with complaints, it really does cast a shadow on their, their ability to come into the office and be positive and, and work for our, our residents, which we really want to see them have that spirit of, uh, wanting to serve the community and be good public servants, and that can help us. And I'm not accusing anyone in this room of that. It's just in general terms. Be careful what you read on social media, and, uh, and, and take an inquisitive approach and verify what you're reading to make sure that it's, it's accurate. 
So with that, I wanted to thank again all of our presenters and all of you all for being here, and I'm gonna leave you with one final thought. Um, I work on some diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, but one thing I always tell people is my analogy for what I like to see us as an organization is, I play in a professional wind ensemble in Santa Fe, and we have members who are physicists at Los Alamos, we have members who are black, we have members who are Hispanic, we have people who are fresh out of college and barely have a dime to their name. We have people with disabilities. None of that matters on concert day when the downbeat happens. All that matters is everybody play their part the best they can cooperatively and create something beautiful together. And that's what I think we should all be doing um, as city representatives. We can have our disagreements, we can you know, work things out in rehearsal, but when the downbeat happens, let's try to create something beautiful together for our community because not only do our residents deserve it, but we deserve it as well. So I again want to thank you all for coming. Sam had to jet, but I, I definitely thank him. He uh, did talk to me. He's willing to come down to do some other trainings for specific topics like quasi-judicial and that type of thing. So um, let us know if that's something you like, and we, we can uh, work to get those uh, trainings scheduled. And also, we do have um, a small budget, but there is some funds available. Work with your staff member. There may be training specific to your function that you might want to attend, um, especially virtual trainings where we can get bang for our buck and spend one registration fee and have multiple people attend locally. But there is an appropriateness for you learning your subject matter, and we do want you to be the subject matter experts on the things that you work on. So just wanted to point that out as well. So enjoy the, the sunny day. I think most of the snow is gone, thank goodness. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Awesome. You too? You're always awesome. That's, could, is that the quasi-judicial stuff? Yes. You got droned out right at the worst time. Oh, I bet. I bet. That's funny. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is going on? Right, right. I know.